all the hazardous materials emergencies that occur in the United States each year, only a very small percentage involve radioactive substances. And the few incidents that do involve potential radiation hazards generally don't result in exposure. Despite these relatively low exposure rates, many people, including emergency responders, assume that any situation involving a radioactive substance is extremely dangerous. This concern sometimes results in resource-intensive efforts that may not be necessary. Your response to a radiation emergency must be based on knowledge. Only knowledge can guarantee both a safe and appropriate approach. Knowing when to take action conserves your time and resources. Knowing when not to take action preserves your health. The use of radioactive materials is more prevalent than you may think. Sometimes it's obvious where they're being used or stored at a site. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes you can predict when radiation hazards will be involved. Sometimes you can't. In other words, radiation emergencies are like other hazardous materials incidents. So your response should be similar. When you arrive at the scene, obtain all the information you can, weigh the risks versus the benefits, and take the appropriate action. In this program, we'll be reviewing three very different types of incidents involving radioactive materials. After each of these incidents is described, your instructor will pause the videotape, and you'll be asked to research the hazard assess the situation, and determine the appropriate action. When the videotape resumes, you'll be able to see how accurately you've planned and conducted your response. However, bear in mind that if there are discrepancies between the action shown in the videotape and your own standard operating procedures, your department's practices should take precedence. The first incident involves a possible chemical spill at a small research laboratory. The incident occurs at night in an area where most of the lab's chemicals are stored. The facility is unoccupied except for two night shift workers. They're working near a storage area housing a pallet of type A boxes which contain radioactive material. Although type A packaging is quite strong, one of the packages is accidentally ripped open by a forklift. Because the box is labeled radioactive, both employees become alarmed. They decide that since they're not paid to take chances with their safety, they're not going to wait around to see if there's any danger. They'll leave the risks to the fire department. Since the incident is reported as a possible chemical spill, the hazardous materials response team is dispatched along with an engine and a ladder company. All units arrive on the scene within a few minutes. When the employees approach the firefighters to explain the situation, the engine company officer instructs the employees to stay back since the chemicals and level of contamination are unknown at this point. Although the employees don't know what's in the damaged containers, they are able to tell the firefighters that the packages are labeled radioactive. They don't recall if other labels were present or if there were any noticeable leaks First responding firefighter actions are limited to securing the area and isolating the individuals who may have been contaminated. The incident commander discusses strategy and tactics with the hazardous materials officer. The hazardous materials response team has had some experience with incidents involving radioactive materials. In addition, the team is equipped with radiation survey instruments and is thoroughly trained in the use of these devices. Incidents involving type A packaging are rare because of the strength of the containers. Also, type A packaging is generally used for lower intensity or smaller quantities of radioactive materials. So, in most actual incidents where containers have been breached, no serious consequences have resulted. Because of these factors, it's unlikely that the incident you just saw would create any exposure or contamination risks if firefighters were to enter the area. On the other hand, there are few benefits to be gained by doing so. The situation doesn't involve injuries or a fire 
or even any loss of property. Given those considerations, appropriate actions for first responders should be limited to notifying the proper radiation authorities and controlling the scene. For the approach, hazardous materials team members wear splash protective chemical resistant clothing and self-contained breathing apparatus. They enter the area upwind from a point about 500 feet from the building storage area. As they move toward the entrance to the storage area, they continuously monitor the atmosphere for radioactivity. They approach to within about 100 feet of the open door. Since no radiation levels have been detected at the 100-foot perimeter, the hotline is established and the area is secured at this point. While the area is being secured, the two employees are monitored for radiation contamination. None is detected, so it isn't necessary to decontaminate them. If any levels of radiation were found, though, thorough decontamination would be required. At this point, firefighters have taken all appropriate control actions. For the duration of the incident, their job is to maintain security and wait for the arrival of radiation authorities. The authorities will be responsible for arranging the disposal of the damaged containers. Because the incident didn't involve an injured party, or a fire, or even a spill, very few risks were apparent. But if any of those variables had to be factored into the situation, the approach may have been very different. As with other hazardous materials incidents, the appropriate response to the emergency depends on balancing risks and benefits. What is the risk to firefighters? And what is the benefit to the public? In some cases, the benefits outweigh the risks, as in this next incident. Update on 3000 Park Drive. An electronics company calls in an alarm indicating a small fire and the possible presence of hazardous materials at one of their manufacturing facilities. The caller reports that the fire began in an area where a metal alloy containing thorium was being used in a production process. When firefighters arrive, they can see smoke but no fire. When the company officer speaks with the facility manager, he learns that while the fire has apparently been suppressed by the facility's employees, one man suffered a head injury while trying to put the fire out. Another worker was unable to move him, and he's still lying on the floor in the production area. The manager also reports that several containers of metal alloy containing thorium have been damaged by the fire. Thorium metal is a radioactive powder, and the injured employee may have come in contact with this material. The manager is understandably upset. He insists that the firefighters take immediate action. He's afraid that his employee may not only be seriously injured, but that he'll also suffer ill effects from radiation exposure to the thorium. Rescue of the injured employee is top priority for several reasons. First, he has what may be a serious head wound. And secondly, he's in immediate danger if the fire reignites. There's also the possibility of radioactive contamination, especially since the thorium powder has been spilled and dispersed. However, this substance is a low-level radioactive material that emits mainly alpha radiation. So the primary concerns in this case are not radioactivity, but the victim's injury and the possibility of fire. When the risks are weighed against the benefits, firefighters decide that entry is justified. According to the emergency response guide, firefighters are adequately equipped to attempt a rescue. Structural firefighting gear with positive pressure self-contained breathing apparatus provides some protection against radiation contamination, particularly against alpha and beta radiation. Radiation detection equipment isn't yet available, so the hotline is established upwind at a 100-foot perimeter. When firefighters enter the hot zone, they see the injured employee lying in debris from the fire. 
The firefighters' primary concerns are the victim's injury and the possibility of the fire reigniting. So they quickly remove the injured party from the area. It isn't apparent whether or not he has been contaminated by contact with thorium metal powder. At the hotline, the victim's clothing is removed as part of the emergency decontamination process. His head wound is covered, since it doesn't appear to be contaminated. The patient is immobilized, and his vital signs are taken. Based on their knowledge of the material involved and standard operating procedures, an emergency medical team transports the patient to the receiving hospital. The hospital has already been notified of the nature of this patient's injuries, as well as his possible exposure. To minimize the possibility of reignition, firefighters apply soda ash over the burnt area. Because the metal and thorium powder may have been dispersed during the fire, decontamination is necessary. A portable decontamination unit is set up and everyone involved with the fire is directed to undress and shower thoroughly with soap and water. After showering, they're monitored for the presence of both alpha and gamma radiation. After these actions are taken, firefighters keep the scene secure until radiation authorities dispose of the spilled material. They make no further entry into the hot zone. Because radioactive materials can be perceived as being more dangerous than they actually are, responders can make the mistake of overlooking fire and chemical hazards out of concern for radiation exposure. But as the previous incident illustrated, many radioactive materials emit only low levels of radiation, and there's usually little danger of significant contamination. It's possible, however, that you could be called to the scene of an incident involving a high-level radioactive material. In these instances, radiation exposure may be your primary concern, even if you don't come into direct physical contact with the radioactive source. That's the case in the next incident. Firefighters respond to the scene of a multiple vehicle traffic accident. A small van collided with a car, sending both vehicles out of control. Because of information received about the call, the hazardous materials response team is also dispatched, but is some distance from the scene. The driver of the car is injured and semi-conscious. The car has been badly damaged, and it looks as though extrication may be difficult. The van that was involved is carrying radioactive placards. The driver of the van isn't injured, and he's able to supply the firefighters with his shipping papers. He's very concerned about the condition of his cargo, and with good reason. According to the shipping papers, the van is transporting a radiography device containing iridium-192, a sealed gamma source. The driver is familiar with these devices and says that as a result of the force of collision, the source may have become separated from its shielding. He explains that while contamination isn't a problem, there is a possibility of exposure, significant exposure, since high levels of gamma radiation are involved. Unlike the other incidents you've seen, this emergency involves a special form material. These materials are generally encapsulated solids that present a hazard only if they're separated from the shielding. Special form solid material isn't easily dispersed, so it poses little risk of contamination. However, exposure can be a significant threat, since these materials may have higher levels of radioactivity. But even when relatively high levels are involved, you're probably at risk only if you touch or handle the source or remain in close proximity for extended periods of time. So in many cases, a rescue can be safely effected if response personnel limit their time in the hot zone, maintain a safe distance, and adequately shield themselves. 
In this situation, firefighters can limit the time spent in the hot zone by rotating personnel frequently according to a specific schedule. And they can maintain some distance from the radioactive source by approaching only as close as necessary to extricate the victim. Firefighters initially establish a hot zone and isolate the area. A two-member entry team, equipped with extrication equipment and wearing structural firefighting gear, enter the hot zone. Since no airborne contamination is present, SCBA isn't required, but the initial entry team brings it as a precaution. To minimize each team's time spent in the possible exposure area, a rotation schedule is established in accordance with standard operating procedures. Entry is attempted from both sides of the victim's car. Because of the extent of damage, however, gaining full access and removing the patient is time consuming. During this initial response, the incident commander notifies the hazardous materials response team of the actions that are being taken. He also requests that personal dosimeters and radiation detection equipment be made available as soon as possible. The first entry team works in the hot zone for a maximum of 10 minutes. At the end of each 10 minute shift, the entry team exits the hot zone and is replaced by another entry team. As soon as the hazardous materials team arrives and is briefed, one member of the hazardous materials team enters the hot zone to take radiation measurements and assist with extrication. He wears a personal dosimeter. After the driver is removed from the vehicle, he's taken to the warm zone for treatment of his injuries. No decontamination is necessary. Neither the first responders nor the hazardous materials team enter the hot zone again. At this point, the fire department's only responsibility is to maintain the security of the area and await the arrival of radiation authorities. If radiation had been detected in the hot zone, readings from the dosimeters and monitoring equipment could be used to estimate exposure for the entry team members and the accident victim. Accidents involving special form materials are rare, but when they happen, the source of radiation is often an industrial radiography device. Remember that while you may be dealing with higher levels of radiation at these incidents, you can still limit your exposure if it's necessary to enter the hot zone to rescue an injured person. Your standard operating procedures should emphasize minimizing responder time in the area, maximizing distance from the source, and using any available shielding. Radiation emergencies are of particular concern if you don't have the knowledge or skills to back up your response. Essentially, they're like any other hazardous materials incident in that the more you know about what you're dealing with, the better you're able to protect your health and safety.